So it's like 35 or 36 minutes. Something like that. And that 35 or 36 minutes led to like World War Zero between the Jews of Babylon and the Jews of, of Israel. Is that right? Yeah. So for the next year, from the following Passover, from Passover 922 yeah. until the end of 923, festivals in the Palestinian and in the Babylonian communities fell on different days. Shalom and welcome back. I am here once again with Dr. Nadia Vidro of University College London. And we had an amazing conversation about the Aviv and how it was observed in the, uh, in the Karaite communities in the 10th and 11th century, this aspect of the biblical calendar. And now I wanna talk about the new moon because there's, there's, there's kind of two pillars of, as I understand it, the biblical calendar, what some would call the Karaite calendar. And, and in this case, you know, I think there's, there's probably even less disagreement in theory between the Rabbinites and the Karaites. Um, and it just comes down to practice, right? Meaning, like, um, in, in principle, most rabbinites historically said that, yes, originally it was the sighting of the new moon, and then when the Messiah comes, it'll go back to the sighting of the new moon. I think, like, maybe Sadia Gaon was an exception to that, but... Exactly. Yeah. Sadia Gaon was a big exception he's a, he's to a that. Special he, case, yeah, yeah, he claimed that Jews always calculated yeah. the calendar. Even though in the Mishnah, we have very clear discussions about how do you interrogate the new moon witnesses, how do you set up the, um, the bonfires or the signal fires... Right, I mean, there's no question, I think, historically, that um, at some point in earlier Jewish history, first and second century, maybe even a little bit later, they were observing the sighting of the new moon. Uh, maybe you can give a little bit background of how we went from that in the rabbinite calendar to the calculations. I know you said Professor Sasha Stern's the experts on that, and um, hopefully we'll speak to him at some point. But just give us a, a quick synopsis of how that happened. So the new moon observation is an ancient way to set the calendar to decide the beginning of the mm -hmm. month that was practiced already by in Babylonia in the second uh, millennium BCE. Mm -hmm. um, and it was... And you uh, don't mean Jews in the second millennium BCE? No, no, I mean... Babylonians, no. Babylon, like non-Jews were using the new moon to cite Absolutely, the and okay. there are cuneiform texts that describe mm -hmm. those procedures, letters about okay. new moon observations and setting months by mm -hmm. the new moon. So um, it's um, a long-standing Near Eastern tradition, and uh, this was also done, as I said, we see this in, Mish in Mishnai calendar. Mm -hmm. um, so the... <clears throat> We see the rabbinic, rabbinic Jews in the Mishnah doing this. Mm -hmm. And um, by the 10th, 11th century, also, obviously, the Muslims did this. So it's a very mm -hmm. long-standing tradition in, in the Near East. Um, exactly how the process of um, a transition between new moon observations and fixed calculated calendar preceded is still um, being researched and mm -hmm. Sasha Stern is doing a lot of research on this. Okay. But it so is the clear final word hasn't been written on that? The final word hasn't wow. been written on okay. that. Yeah. It is clear that um, in the Amoraic period, mm -hmm. that's in the Talmud, you see the calendar being more and more fixed, uh, more and more, the observations are more and more limited by various rules, by various calendrical rules. Mm -hmm. um, how many, how many months of 29 and 30 days you're allowed to have per year? Mm -hmm. um, which months are only allowed to be uh, full, that's our 30 days, 30, yeah. and which months are only allowed to be 29 days. So you see more and more of those calendrical mm -hmm. rules coming in, uh, the rules that certain festivals are not allowed to fall on certain uh, on certain days of the week also comes in during the Amoraic period. And this is um, uh, a gradual fixing and movement towards calculated calendar. And at some point, they bring in the calculation of moledot, of mean conjunctions. And it's important to mention, sometimes molad is translated as the new moon in the sense of the observed new moon, and this is wrong. New, uh, molad is only a calculated new moon, which actually is a couple of days before the new moon can be observed. I I've heard the terms used astronomical new moon, I mean the term as astronomers use it, versus the visible new moon or the crescent new moon. Yeah, uh, so and, and there's a lot of confusion. I remember when I, was a, when I was a teenager and I was trying to figure this stuff out and I would look in the, the Chicago Tribune and it would say new moon and I would go up to a hilltop. There's only one hill in Chicago. 
I would go to the hilltop, Mount, it was called Mount Trashmore, because uh, it was <laughs> built on trash. And I never saw the new moon. I couldn't understand it. It said it in the newspaper, and it was never visible. And I went to the um, Adler Planetarium in Chicago, and I asked them, and they're like, no, that that's not the visible new moon. That, that's just how astronomers use it, because we don't, they explained, we don't care about the sighting of the moon. We're interested in, in a, um, basically, it's what we would call conjunction. Yeah. And it wasn't even conjunction. It's what you call mean conjunction. What is mean conjunction versus, at, let's start with what conjunction is. And then uh, um, maybe tell us what mean conjunction well, is. Well, conjunction is the state of the moon that it, when it is least illuminated and it can't mm -hmm. be observed. And this is because the, the Earth, the moon, and the sun are on one line. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't see the moon from Earth. Okay. So that's conjunction. That's conjunction. Then what's mean conjunction? Um, if you observe the time of many, many conjunctions mm -hmm. and then average it out, Okay. Then that's the, the time of the mean conjunction. So mean meaning average. Average. Yeah. So it might not be that that's the actual conjunction, because that could be 12 hours before or 12 hours later, but they didn't have the technology or maybe the... the or the, the interest. Or the interest, okay, in calculating it that precisely, that they, they were uh, just interested in... And, and they were interested in the average. And so the, the Hill L2, what's called the Hill L2 calendar... The modern rabbinical calendar uses this mean conjunction. Uses this mean conjunction. Okay. Mean conjunctions uh, occur every month, so that there's a regular interval between two mean conjunctions, whereas bef between two um, two actual conjunctions, the the interval is not always the same. The, the deviation is not very big. I mean, okay. it's not three days, but no, but it could be like twelve hours. Yeah, so, so okay. uh, it, it's not a very convenient measure for a calendar, for a calculated calendar, whereas the mean conjunction is a simple and convenient so, and yeah. regular measure. So if you don't have a, a, a computer or a calculator, it's much easier if you're running numbers by hand to do mean conjunction. What? And then my understanding of how they, they figured it out is they had all these, uh, well, wasn't it... Um, uh, Ptolemy's Alma guess that he that can, that, can that is the, that, that is the value that is in the Alma Alma guest or okay. Alma guest. Uh, I could be mispronouncing it. <laughs> um, so that's the value that's in Ptolemy's Alma guest, uh, and um, the current thinking is that the Jewish calendar borrowed it from Ptolemy. Okay, even though Maimonides would say it was the other way around, but he actually says that he says that the the Greeks took it from the Jews. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you said we took it from the Greeks, but the Greeks got it from the tribe of Issachar. So something like that. Well, that's so. not the current thinking. Let's okay, say in this. any event. Um, so, all right. So so the rabbinical calendar gradually goes, for, and it, not in one moment. You said it wasn't a big bang in the previous no, it conversation. Wasn't a big bang. It wasn't a sudden shift. It was a gradual shift from actual observation to these calculations. The, the calculations culminate around the year 921. In, in a fixing of the calendar, of in, the rabbinical calendar, right? In the early 10th century, the calendar was as we know it today, but there was a slight, slight change, um, a difference in calculation between mm -hmm. Palestinians and Babylonians. Okay. In most years, it made no difference whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want me to go into those technical details. So, you sure, let's get something about Tuesday or something. <laughs> let's go into those details. Meaning that they're looking at this average and they've got a bunch of rules for postponements. Exactly. And those rules so weren't one of the, identical. One of the so, rules yeah, of postponements about. was different in the Babylonian and the Palestinian calendar. Mm -hmm. um, there's this rule that if the molad occurs after noon. Mm -hmm. that Meaning after 12 noon. After 12 noon, okay. counted from 6 p.m. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this isn't the Gregorian calendar. Okay, go no, on. No. Um, that then you need to postpone um, the beginning of the month to, of Tishri. Right. And the medieval pronunciation, by the way, is not Tishrei, it's Tishri. Okay. So then you have to postpone the beginning of Tishri to the following day. Mm -hmm. That's the rule in the modern calendar, and that was the rule in the Babylonian calendar. Okay. Whereas in the Palestinian calendar, uh, the rule was slightly different. You had to postpone a little bit later if it occurred not at 12 noon, but at 12 noon and 641 parts. After and there's 1,080 parts in, a, in an hour? So... Uh, 1,080 parts. Okay, in an so, hour. I'm, so bad at, um, I'm bad at math here. You said 641 yeah. divided by 1,080. So that's, oh, now we do times 60. So it's like 35 or 36 minutes. Something like that. And that 35 or 36 minutes led to like World War Zero between 
the Jews of Babylon and the Jews of, of Israel. Is that right? Yeah. In the year, That's incredible. In the wow. year nine, 36 minutes. In the year 921, mm -hmm. they calculated um they calculated they calculated the same molad, the same mean mm -hmm. conjunction, but it fell so that according to the Babylonians, the year the day had to be postponed. Mm -hmm. The Tishi had to be postponed. Mm -hmm. And according to the Palestinians, mm -hmm. it didn't. Okay. So for the next year, from the following Passover, from Passover 922 yeah. until the end of 923, festivals in the Palestinian and in the Babylonian communities fell on different days. So, so wait a minute. So let's say in Cairo, where you had Babylonian Jews and, you know, you had Yerushalmim, the, the Jerusalemite Jews, they could have been observing on different days in the same city even. Is that? Uh, I think so. Wow. So you talked in the last program about how the Karaites were especially tolerant. Was there a great degree of tolerance here among the rabbinites um, over this? Not really. There was a huge okay. polemic. Okay. There was a huge polemic, um, a, a, a big controversy. Again, Sasha Stern um, published an amazing book about this in 2019 mm -hmm. called The Jewish Calendar Controversy of 921-22, mm -hmm. okay. um, published with Brill. We'll throw that up here on the screen. <laughs> Uh, so there was a very big controversy mm -hmm. um, that was carried out purely by letter and uh, in writing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the communities still stuck to their own dates. Both communities stuck to their own dates. Um, but they weren't happy with each other. Mm -hmm. They weren't really tolerant. There was this idea that... Um, in scholarship, there was this idea that if if you celebrate on different dates, you can no longer be one people, one nation, one religion. You have to split. But um, what do you mean in scholarship? In modern academic scholarship? in modern academic scholarship, okay. yeah, people like Ancore and Pelmon and okay. But what we observe in practice is there was a big controversy in writing, but they didn't really. Um, they weren't really intolerant to the point of breaking up completely. So they didn't split into two communities where they wouldn't speak to each other over this. That's it. They just That's disagreed and, and wrote nasty letters. <laughs> no, nasty letters and tried to convince the other okay. authorities. Um, but in the end, mm -hmm. the, um, the calendars conver converged uh, so back how come to this the hasn't happened again since 921? It did happen again in 927. What? <laughs> Wait, I don't know this part. Uh, they, uh, well, the, the, diff the, the calendrical difference happened again. Yeah, but there wasn't a fight over it. Um, or was there? And there is some evidence that they probably celebrated on different dates, but there wasn't a fight because they fighted. Wow, so I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, there was a fight only just a few years before and it didn't bring anything, so okay. nothing happened. And... Um, the feeling is that they just didn't fight over it. There so wasn't the political okay. will to fight over so, it. So you have this these differences within the rabbinical calendar, which are r pretty rare, right? They Extremely are. rare. Um, once it reaches a certain stage in its evolution. Now talk to me about the Karite calendar in the 10th, 11th century. Um, so the Karite calendar in the 10th, 11th century, um, and actually in terms of New Moon also much later, continued to follow this... Um, the tradition of new moon sightings, mm -hmm. uh, which, as I said, was an ancient tradition in the Near East. So mm -hmm. they are sort of traditionalists. Um, they uh, fixed beginnings of months every but month. I got to point out the irony here that Karaites, who in principle uh, say we follow scripture and reject tradition, tend to be traditionalists in some ways. I've seen this in my own research. Like I looked at this 14th century Torah scroll and it has line fillers. Well, you're not allowed to have line fillers in, in Torah scrolls, but when you look at 10th century, even Rabbinite Torah scrolls, they have them, right? So you had this halakha that spread and stamped out putting in line fillers. So they said it's an extra symbol, not, not, uh, not allowed. And the Karaites are the ones who are following this traditional scribal practice, maybe not even realizing you know, that, oh, we're following something ancient, just this is how I was taught to write. Oh, right? so, so, so it's very interesting that it, it, it's it's um, um, it's counterintuitive that Karaites sometimes tend to be traditionalists. But okay, so go on. So they're following this thing that goes back to ancient times and certainly in ancient Judaism. 
Um, and the principle of it is very simple. Mm -hmm. At the end of 29 days, mm -hmm. since the beginning of the previous month, you go out yeah. uh, around um, sunset mm -hmm. and you observe the moon. If you can see the new crescent, then the old month is over. It mm -hmm. was 29 days long. And you look uh, over the western horizon because mm -hmm. this is where the, you can see the new moon. Uh, if you if you observe it, if you sight it, then mm. the previous month is over. It was twenty nine days long, yeah. and on that evening the new month begins. Okay. If you do not observe it, and it can be that it just isn't yet visible, or there are clouds in the sky, or uh, dust, something like that. Mm. If you don't observe it, then you make the month. 30 days long, and the beginning of the month is on the following day. And Karaites didn't actually observe um, the moon on the following day because they were, um, uh, the idea was that it will definitely be visible after 30 days since the previous okay. new moon. So it was by default the next day? It was by default the next okay. day. So that's um, that's the basic procedure, mm -hmm. and it's very simple. And again, yeah. it's the same pr basic procedure as all lunar yeah. calendars based on the new moon observation are following. Um, but nature obviously never listens to our basic procedures. Okay. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, it is difficult to observe the new moon. Mm -hmm. It's very faint, it's very small, it sets soon after sunset. Mm -hmm. um, so you can miss it. Yeah. Um, you can observe a whiff of cloud and think it's the new moon. Mm -hmm. Or they can generally very simply be clouds and you can't observe it. Mm -hmm. And if it happens in one month, that's all right. But for example, if there are clouds there are a number of months mm -hmm. in a row, uh, you're going to to be out widely compared to the new moons. So Karaites had all sorts of additional rules. They had to introduce okay. additional rules, not just rely on observation only. So uh, like what are some examples? Of these for example, rules? they had a rule of how many how many mo full months of thirty days are allowed in the calendar, and okay. how many. Um, months of 29 days are allowed in the calendar. Mm -hmm. They said um, there was a bit of a disagreement. <laughs> okay. I'm shocked. <laughs> All right. But I think, um, if I remember correctly, everybody agreed that there can be no more than four 30 day months. Okay. But how many 29 days in a row there can be? Some said four, some said three, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and it is interesting that. Um, at least some uh, authorities like Levi Ben Yefet and those mm -hmm. who followed him, because Levi Ben Yefet was really uh, foundational for later uh, for later legal thinking, mm -hmm. and calendar is part of legal thinking, obviously. Okay. Um, so Levi Ben Yefet said that if you had four uh, full months in a row, you don't need to observe the moon in the following after four full months because. Oh wow. Because you assume the next one's 29 days. Yeah, it, it, it's bound to be there because you're bound wow. to be out. <laughs> well, no, th this is interesting. I'll tell you why this is interesting. And this is, I'm speaking here from experience of observing new moons. If you have four 30 day months in a row, first of all, you could have 43 day, 30 day months in a row with perfect clear clouds astronomically as possible. Mm -hmm. Sorry, with perfect clear conditions without any clouds, right? Meaning in an ideal observing conditions, you could have four 30 day months. Um, And, it, and, and all it would take was one month with cloud and three 30-day months is easy, right? Um, and the fourth one, let's say, is clouds. So what could happen at the end of that is the moon is visible on the 27th or 28th day. There's a discussion so, about that. So and we'll talk about that in a minute. But maybe, I wonder if he's saying you don't need to look because he doesn't want you to go look. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, wonder, I once had a situation where we went in this modern times, this 21st century, where the moon was visible after... Um, at, it was a 28 day month because the end, there have been clouds and the next month we went and looked for the moon and, and it was what we call uh nira ba'alil which is a term specifically uh that comes from the context of the calendar meaning it was seen blatantly by anybody who who don't even have to go up to a hilltop and look you can just see it up high in the sky so it was nira ba'alil it was clearly visible to anybody who looked and so we ended up with a 28 day month and i ha and i had a man who who flew across the United States to, to confront me about this. And he was so upset. He said, you told me there could only be a 29-day month. 
And I said, but we saw it. What did you want me to do? He said, you shouldn't have looked. <laughs> and, and he meant it. He, he, he felt betrayed that we had looked and seen the moon when I had been wrong. I thought you could, it couldn't happen, but it happened. So this is discussed. So talk about this. This is No, this is golden right here. Everybody pay attention. What do they say? <laughs> this isn't a discussed. Um, so after four, four, after four 30 day months, you don't yeah. need to observe. I don't think it's because you're not supposed to see it. I think okay. it's Just because it's a, it's a tircha, it's a pain. Exactly. Why, okay. why, why go to why the pain? Why put yourself of... out? Okay. Exactly. Fair enough. Um, but there is a discussion. There's a famous passage in the Babylonian yeah. Talmud that, uh, about Ra uh, Rabban Gamliel. Uh, when they, um, I think it's in Sanhedrin 20A or B, but okay. don't catch me on that. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen here. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so that the sky was clouded for a number of months, and mm -hmm. then the people saw the, saw the moon. And here you need to pay attention because in the printed Talmud, it says on the 29th day. Oh, wow. But in, uh, in many, Earlier manuscripts, it actually says on the twenty seven after tw well, after twenty seven, not twenty nine, but twenty seven. Oh wow! But Rabban Gamli uh, and the people were preparing to uh -huh. to sanctify the moon because they saw the crescent. But mm -hmm. Rabban Gamliel said, "No, the I have a tradition that a month can only be twenty nine days and a half and um, seven nine three parts." Okay. Uh, and the Karaites discuss this and say, well, of course the moon appeared after 27 days because they had a run of 30-day um, months due to clouds and wow. the, actual wow. the actual crescent appeared before uh, the, the uh -huh. 30 days. And in the previous months. In meaning. previous months. Okay. And they say, it just wasn't visible because of clouds. Because of that, exactly. Wow. So, and they say, Rabban Gamliel um, didn't fix the month when the crescent appears for reasons of expediency, that's what it says. Who, who says that in the Talmud? The, the Karaites say. Oh, that, okay. They discuss this uh, this story and say Rabban Gamliel didn't fix it for reasons of expediency, but okay. we do it. Uh huh. So I have an impression Wait, that back up. sometimes we, the Karaites of we, the tenth, eleventh century, yeah, we 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 would if, do it. So if we see it after twenty-seven days, then that twenty-eighth day is the beginning of the next month. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> We say in English, drop the mic and walk away. That, that was amazing. What, what text is this? Is this Levi um, ben Yefet? So there's a discussion in Levi ben Yefet oh, and also wow. his father, Yefet ben Eli, okay. talked about this. Wow, wow. This, this is amazing stuff. So this, this was the practical reality of an observable calendar. So, what, so he, what do you want to do? So the here's something. <laughs> so here's something I, know, I don't know anything about. So the Muslims have an observable observational calendar of the new moon. What did they do in that situation? Do you have any idea? Or? I know that at least sometimes uh, the most important from them is the new moon of Ramadan. Oh, okay. And this is the one that they really waited to observe sometimes. Sometimes they had 31 day long months before Ramadan because they, they were waiting to sight the moon. Because they couldn't sight the moon sometimes. Interesting. Um, Did the Karaite sources ever talk about a 31 day no, month? No, I don't think so. Oh, because by default, by default after, they fixed okay. it previously. Yeah. Oh, so that's interesting. Okay, um, so that, that's a big difference between the, the way Karaites observe the calendar. Yeah, and, I don't know very Muslim. much about okay. this, but this is what I read. Okay, and this is a great opportunity in the comments. If you know something about the Islamic calendar, come and share in the comments because you know, I, I don't know either. I, I know like zero about the Islamic calendar, um, except for their Muslim new moon observers in modern times. And um, uh, th th there have been issues, there were issues, especially 20 years ago or so, 30 years ago, where there were certain Gulf states that were offering cash rewards for the first person to sight the new moon. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they would see it like two days before the <laughs> conjunction. Like, who could have seen that coming? <laughs> <laughs> so they, I think they stopped doing that because they realized, okay, we've got a billion Muslims. We don't need to pay people to <laughs> claim they saw the moon. But anyway, um, so, wow, this is amazing stuff. So, so, all right. So, so were there, so we talked about with the Aviv, how there were different factions. Did we have that with the, with the new moon? Um, I don't think in the same sense as uh, in case of Aviv, observations mm -hmm. of the new moon were local. Okay. So every, every town was allowed to carry out their own observation mm -hmm. and um, 
and obviously they came to different results because, as they say, they can be clouds in Ramle and clear skies in Tiberias. Wait, so wait a minute. Hold on a second. So you're saying if if there were clouds in Ramle and they saw the new moon in Tiberias, in Tiberias they would observe it on Sunday and in Ramle they would do it on Monday. That's, that's... Possible. They also okay. wrote to each other. They okay. did send messages to each so other. So if they got a message that you saw it in Tiberias, that would have... Then retro- retrojectively, they would fix the new the, the beginning of the month okay. to the previous day. And that would work with every holiday except for Yom Teruah. Um, there's a discussion about that. So, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're like E.F. Hutton. What is she saying? I'm listening. So um, That's a reference from the 80s, guys. All right. Yeah, I didn't get it. <laughs> it's American culture, it's fine. Yeah. So, so wait. So, what would happen if if? Um... Um, so, I get the impression that sometimes they did the same with Yom Tov as well. Okay. Um, if news arrived during this, would be Yom Tov. They would celebrate the festival from the time when the news when news arrived. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You're not even talking about Yom Kippur. You're talking about the actual day of Yom Tov. They're in the middle of the observance. And then they find out what? That the moon was... Um, Sighted somewhere. They b- b- And so they're like, okay, it's, Yom okay, Tra was yesterday. We don't need to keep Yom Tra anymore. Is that... Um, yes, or if it arrived in the middle of the day, uh, then from that moment in the day, we'll observe Yom Tra. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, I see what you're saying. Um, it's one of the opinions. I don't know how mm. many people did that. Okay. Because um, uh, there's also the opinion that if you're not sure, you should actually keep two days. For Yom Tura. For every festival. For every until, festival. Until you're sure. You should okay. fast Yom Kippur for two days. Okay. That's Levi Ben Yefet again. And, and, he, and he promotes that opinion or he mentions that, you know, Yesho Mlim some say. Uh, no, no. That's his opinion. Oh, really? That's his opinion. Wow. I think he's maybe the okay. first. To, and if you look in later Babylonian, uh, not Babylonian, Byzantine sources like mm. Hadassi and later so- Byzantine yeah. sources, you actually see them repeat this. Two days of Yom Kippur. Um, if you have to, if you have okay. to, but, right. but he does, he does acknowledge that until Yom Kippur, you'll probably know. I see. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess you could say on some level, you never know for sure, right? If there's clouds. Um, well, if there's clouds all the way until Yom Kippur, but for example, if you see it on what may be day two or maybe day one, and you can observe how thick the crescent is and how bright uh, well, and that's, I, how I can high. tell you from experience that's quite dangerous because what what you think is a second or third day moon might be a you know first or second day moon. So, so well, tell Levi. <laughs> okay, well. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Any final you. words you wanna wanna share about the re- want to maybe share what some of the research you're working on now is or things you have planned for the future? Um maybe instead of Or whatever you want to share. Maybe instead of what I'm working on now, I would like to say that this Karait literature from the 10th, 11th centuries yeah. is amazingly interesting. And there's a huge amount of it, and most of it is still in manuscripts. Mm-hmm. Uh, unreconstructed, unedited, unpublished. Mm-hmm. So very few people actually get access to it. And it's very difficult to research it. And it's very difficult for, for people who are not researchers to access it at all. So yeah. I think it's one of the real priorities of research and also for funders, I'd say, to fund research you into hear that, those, guys? <laughs> to fund research into those manuscripts and mm-hmm. to just bring them out, to just make them accessible, because uh, really the, as my um, PhD supervisor says, philology is uh, is the power room of history. Without philology, without this philological research of um, editing texts and making them accessible, available, it's impossible to do history. Right, you don't know what really happened if you haven't read the text to exactly. describe what happened, and we don't know what's there. So, yeah. wow, all there so, is and, there to discover. And, and, and just just to reiterate what we talked about in the first part, uh, in the first discussion, you spent three years researching and reading this literature, and 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 I would it sounds like you've you've barely scratched the surface. There's so much more that needs to be done. Absolutely, wow. absolutely. I read those texts, but I definitely didn't have time to edit them, translate them, and I'm sure I haven't read all of them. Wow. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you. You have been listening to Nehemia Gordon's Raw's Dream of Torah Consciousness. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. 
Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.